Good morning, everyone. And if it's not morning where you are, well, let's get this covered. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Thank you, Truman Show. Welcome to another episode of the AlbumReview.net podcast. I'm Greg Potters. Thank you for listening and thank you for your interactions and feedback. Your feedback is much appreciated and it helps me to always improve. So this is my 20th episode, so I'm celebrating. I cannot believe I've made 20 of these. Well, like my last episode, I have another special guest today. This special guest is an author and musician. He reached out to me a few months ago and I'm thrilled to have him on the podcast. Today's special guest published a book, which I had a chance to read before recording this, where he tells his story about being a session musician in the music business. This is a real treat, guys. Ivan Funkboy Bodley, believe it or not, has performed over 3,000 career shows, playing an average of 228 gigs a year. He's a bass player, musical director, author, and amazing storyteller. He's performed with 50 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees, appeared in 12 Broadway shows, played at President Obama's inauguration night in 2009, and has been inducted into the New York Blues Hall of Fame. He can currently be seen on tour with Humble Pie as well. So Ivan and I are going to talk about life on the road as well as his debut book, Am I Famous Yet? Memoir of a Working Class Rock Star. Here, Ivan chronicles his life on the road performing with artists such as Sting, Elvis Costello, Bo Diddley, Winona Judd, and many more. So before I get started, I want to remind you that you can listen to all of my podcast album reviews by going to albumreview.net and clicking on the podcast tab. They can also be heard wherever podcasts are available. You can also read well over 30 written reviews at albumreview.net and pick up some merchandise from your favorite bands, albums, sound systems, and you've got to check out the bookstore. Have you guys ever wanted to learn more about your favorite musician or band that you just can't find on the internet? Well, go to albumreview.net and click on the store tab where you can grab a copy of different biographies and autobiographies. I've got them from artists such as Eric Clapton, Pink Floyd, Motley Crue, Tom Petty, Eddie Van Halen, Metallica, Kinda Blue, The the Making of Miles Davis' Masterpiece, and I'm gonna have Ivan's book up there as well so you can pick it up. Alrighty then, sit back, grab a drink, you guys, and listen to my interview with Ivan Funkboy Bodley. All right, well, so joining me today is uh, professional musician and author Ivan Bodley. Ivan is a a working class musician who's partnered with several artists such as Sting, (laughs) Elvis Costello, uh, Living Color, Winona Judd, Stanley Clark, Bo Diddley in a number of different capacities and a ton more. So we're going to talk about a bunch of these today, as well as Ivan's book, Am I Famous Yet? Memoir of a Working Class Rock Star. In this book, Ivan archives his life on the road, meeting and performing with many of these musicians that I just mentioned. Uh, In this episode, Ivan and I will talk about his life as a professional musician on the road and in the studio as portrayed in his book. So with with a career that has taken him to more than 29 countries playing to audiences of up to 82,000 people, It's no wonder that Ivan Funkboy Bodley is truly a working class rock star. So Ivan, thanks so much for being on the albumreview.net podcast with us today. Man, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Really yeah, cool. yeah. So so we connected a couple of weeks ago, and I'm really grateful you reached out to me. And when, when I read your book, I was really interested to talk to you. And before getting into your book, it, you were a, a Berkeley College of Music educated musician, correct? That is correct. A, a Berkeley graduate, I might add, because as you know, being a Bostonian, the, the graduation rate is fairly low at Berkeley. <laughs> I've heard. People tend, yeah, people tend to get gigs, so that, and nobody's ever asked to see your Berkeley diploma before you apply for a job. So I actually right. graduated. <laughs> graduate and when i back when i was in school i think the graduation rate was probably around a third only about wow. a third of the people actually graduated so yeah i graduated magna cum laude i am a board certified bass player 
And uh, that and uh, a calling card will get you a free phone call, I guess. Right. <laughs> well, I think I mentioned this to you last time we talked, but I purchased my very first bass guitar in 1989 at the Daddy's Junkie Music right across the right. street. And great store. Oh, my. As you noted, I think on uh, page one of your book that while you were at Berkeley, you printed out a quote from piano player Oscar Peterson and put it on the yeah. wall of your practice room. That's um, right. remember that each, I, I wrote it down. Remember Cause I loved it. Remember that each of you has something to give that no one else has. That's an awesome motivational quote to read every day. So let me ask, when did you know that you wanted to become a musician? I'm still unsure. I'm 30 years <laughs> into, the, into the career and, uh, it could change at any moment. Now, I don't know, you know, like I got to it very late. I, I really never picked up a bass guitar until I was a senior in high school. Like there was no music program in my, my ritzy prestigious prep school, right? No music education program at all. So I kind of picked it up on my own. So by the time I was going off to college for the first time, I was in no position to go to music school. I went to Tulane university initially as a biomedical engineering major. Right. And then I ended up switching to the psychology department. But most of what I did in, in New Orleans was I majored in college radio. I was the music director of my college station. And that kind of catapulted me into the music business proper. Like I was always interested right. in being a musician, but I never really sort of had the wherewithal to think that I was, had enough background or prep to actually be able to make that a career choice. Yeah. So I got into the music business uh, upon graduation. My, my first uh, job out of Tulane was was uh, being uh, working in the publicity department at Epic Records, right. where I worked my way up through the ranks, where I would, got finally was made a manager of West Coast publicity for Epic Portrait and CBS Associated Labels, and I had a corporate Amex card and the whole thing. And I was rubbing elbows with rock stars, my heroes, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I said, this is great. This has nothing to do with music, however. This is all marketing. What, what You know, the music, the business is all the marketing stuff. So I decided that what I wanted to do, and, and also while, because uh, the, the music, the record company job was first in New York and then in Los Angeles. So when I was in Los Angeles, I was taking night classes during the summer at BIT, the Bass Institute over there. Okay. And so, you know, because I've been playing sort of semi-pro when I was at Tulane and now in New Orleans, but not, and again, not enough to sort of make it a full-time career. And then as I'm working at the record company, I'm taking night classes and I'm studying and I'm thinking like, well, maybe one day. And then finally, I kind of hit the wall. And this is that, you know, again, with the with the corporate Amex card and the, and the full-time right. uh, uh, major label job, I said, I, I don't want to do this. The only thing I really right. want to do is play bass. And and that was a very difficult realization because um, that means that, you know, all the job security goes away. Right. You know, all the stuff that you've been building up towards this time, you know, all your 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 stability goes away. So uh, that's when I decided, all right, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to go back to school, go to Berkeley, get the gaps in my education filled in, and then possibly I'll have a shot at making this work. Still didn't know if I could do it, but I thought, you know, I needed to get that second degree from Berkeley to see if I could actually make this thing work. But let me ask you this, like as a kid, even going through prep school and everything, was music ever considered an, an outlet to you? Meaning like, did you immerse yourself ever in music growing up just to kind of escape? I mean, you know, no more than anybody else did, you know, playing my mom's record collection, you know, yeah. like she had Gladys Knight and the Pips and, and Stevie Wonder and, uh, uh, Beatles and show tunes and I Cantina live at Carnegie Hall. You know, I used to, I used to disappear into those records, listening to them as a fan. Yeah. But it never occurred to me that I could participate in that until 17. You know, I right. sort of dabbled with a couple of music lessons as a kid because parents think you should take music lessons. You know? Right. So, Always. Yeah. I played Piano, viola. Usually, right? Yeah. Well, I played viola for a week. I played guitar for a week. I played piano for about six months and none of that stuck. None of that, like that's all, you know, before I was 12 years old. Right. And then nothing, nothing, nothing. And when I'm 17, I'm figuring like maybe bass, you know, it's like it's four strings and one note at a time. How hard could it be? So is that what drew you? That was going to be my next question. Is that kind of what drew you to the bass? Like, Hey, let me check it out. That's part of it. You know, I think I have a theory that your instrument chooses you, not that you choose your instrument, because each right. sort of instrument has a different personality style right. that kind of goes along with it and, and it, what is functioning in the band. So the bass is a supportive instrument. You know, you're not usually you're not standing out front, you know, with your hand in the air going, look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, right. that's sort of a, a lead guitar player's job exactly. or a lead singer's job. So you kind of have to be more of a supportive person, personality type. You have to be more of a team player. You know, it's not such a, a solo rock star kind of instrument. 
Um, and then you'll notice sort of as you're in your travels through the world, you'll find that there are different personality types that tend to recur for different instrument chairs. Like all trumpet players, all lead trumpet players think that they are just great people. And you're like, okay, cool. You know, but you know, they need that confidence to be able to play, you know, their note is the top note of the band. So that, that note needs to be right. If they crack, you know, the, the baritone sax player cracks a note, it probably will sneak by. If a trumpet player cracks a note, everybody knows it. So they, you know, subsequently they also had to have that ego behind it saying like, yes, I am great. Uh, and the bass player is just like, you know, the guy in the back who, you know, <laughs> right, right. Oh, I know I'm a bass player myself yeah. and right. um, I know the feeling, but now let me, let me ask you, you play the upright bass as well, right? Or you have, I do, I do. Yeah. I, I consider myself an electric bass principal with an acoustic double, if that makes sense. How hard is it or different is it to the, you know, the electric bass? I think it's the same tuning and it's the same sort of fingering, just that the scale length is larger. It's like a 40 inch scale instead of a 34 inch scale. So you got, and it's also a fretless thing. And I was just going to say, yeah, they're fretless. I've just always been fascinated when I've watched yeah. upright bass players. It just, I, it, to me, I've been a bass player for 32 years and I, I, I don't know if, if I picked one up tomorrow and upright, if I'd be able to, to jump right in, but you, you're saying it's it, not it that much different. You, it would take you a week. Yeah. It would take you a week. Like, you know, your way around, you know, you can, if you can play a blues and G on a Fender bass, you can play oh, yeah. a blues and G on an upright bass. You right. Know? Right. You got to right. open up, open up your ears a little bit so you can kind of get the fretless thing happening. But if you've ever yeah. played fretless electric, you know how that kind of works. Right. Um, and then, yeah, you could, you, you definitely would find yourself, find your way around much quicker than you would expect. I think, because again, the relationship of where the notes are and the fingering patterns is all the same. Right. It's just a little, a little brighter, a little wider. That's all. Yeah. Now I, I'm, I want to bounce around a, a little bit. Um, where is, where did the nickname funk boy come from? Just out of curiosity. Ah, like all of the best nicknames that was bestowed upon me. You can't, you can't take <laughs> you can't your, own make up your own nickname. Right. right. No, it doesn't count. It doesn't. And, and people can tell like, Oh, this guy calls himself that, you know, no, it, it, that came from oddly enough being a DJ on my college station because of the way that I grew up again with my mom's record collection, with all the soul music records that I grew up in the, in the deep South, you know, I knew who King Floyd was. Right. I know who Sam and Dave was, you know, and all the other kids at Tulane, a lot of them were like, you know, white kids from long Island, like just didn't know those records. So right. they called me the funk boy. Cause I, I was the guy who knew how to spin, spin the funk records on the radio station. You know, you mentioned you grew up in the South. It was uh, Tennessee, right? Chattanooga, Tennessee, born and bred. Salute. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. And you're in uh, New York now? Yes. I'm in Queens, yeah. New York. I've been in New York since 92 full time. I was here briefly in the 80s, but I've been here, yes, since, oh, yeah, 20, almost 30 years. Oof. Wow. <laughs> Coming up. <laughs> time flies, man. And now it you does. mentioned in your book your parents divorced when you were nine, correct? That's right. That is yeah. Right. So how do you think that shaped you, Ivan? You know, it's hard to know. It, it, it all goes into, you know, all the adversity that you uh, experience goes into shaping who you are. Right. So, you know, I'm sure that had an effect. I can't say exactly how, you know, because both of my parents were very loving and very supportive. Right. Um, you know, and then like or, or being, you know, being ostracized or hazed in school. Is that the thing that, that shapes you like? It's hard to know exactly how it manifests, but it, it po might possibly give you some motivation to be like, you know, if, if you feel that you've experienced adversity to go like, OK, I'll show you guys, I'll show you all, you know, I'll make something of myself. I'll be a bass player. That'll that'll teach you. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I've got a younger brother and I've got we've got a much younger half sister. So uh, the way that it went, at least when I was growing up, a lot of times my friends that had older siblings, they were influenced by their older brother or sister's music. Since you were right. the oldest, would, you, would it be safe to say that you kind of influenced your younger siblings? Um, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to say no. Knowing my brother's record collection, <laughs> more into like uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer kind of stuff like he was got into some real proggy stuff sort of very early on that that didn't come from me i don't know where he got that so right. you know no and and again yeah my older sibling wasn't my older sibling it was my my very young mother who was you know she was 20 22 i think when she had me so she had a very hip record collection and that would became my my early influence from actually from my parents which is lucky because a lot of people's parents 
did not have hip record collections at all, you know, and, and right. sort of go, go figure it out elsewhere. Like, as you say, from the older sibling. Yeah. I mean, I had to kind of learn on my own. My parents had a few interesting records, but, but it was really my friends that had older siblings that would say, mm -hmm. Hey, you know, I remember the first time a friend of mine sat me down and said, you have to listen to the who, you know, you have yeah. to listen to Led Zeppelin. And, you know, yeah. I was like eight years old and I thought, what, uh, you know, stuff on the radio then was, you know, this was the, the, the early eighties. So it was, you know, really like glam, glam rock, glam metal was some of the stuff sure. that I was into, but um, I was just curious. And, and, you know, I wanted to touch upon, you mentioned in your book as well, you went to an all boys prep school, right? I certainly did. The Baylor School for Boys in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They went co-ed about four years after I left. I was like, oh, oh. great. Now, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think I told you, I, I did as well. I went to a school here in, in right. Massachusetts for, for five yeah. years, and it was a really interesting experience. Could, could you tell us a little bit more about what your experience there was like? Yeah, the, you, you know, interesting is the word. Yeah, it was it was a tough experience for me because I was not sort of you know of that kind of elitist sort of rich kind of background you know my parents were very working class they were you know uh, computer programmers and engineers that worked for the government tennessee valley authority you know kind of thing so like i didn't really fit in with that kind of country club sort of crowd that was not my people i was among them but i was not of them and they let, let they let me know i was not of them you know like because i didn't have the, the the uniform or whatever i didn't have the pedigree which was fine, you know, I, I found my way sort of, you know, going through the, the, the theater program at school and that kind of thing. Uh, and also it was a very athletic focused school and I was not a team sports kind of guy at all. I was, I'm, I'm into like solo sort of endurance sports. Like, you know, years ago I ran a couple of marathons, you know, I run probably five miles every day. You know, I, uh, growing up I was into, my, my, my dad was heavily into canoeing, kayaking and hiking. So we were outdoors doing sporty things all the time, but football, baseball, all that kind of stuff, all the team sports that, that the school was focused on was not for me at all. So I was kind of the odd man out kind of right from the get go. And again, as you say, these sort of adversity types of things are sort of what kind of shapes your personality. Um, but that said, you know, the public schools in Tennessee at that time were not great. Right. Not great. So this was the sort of a chance to actually get some book learning from some people who actually knew what they were doing. And that was very valuable. So, you know, I got a, a great education with a bunch of kids who hated me. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> now being around all that testosterone as a young person, did you find yourself having to run from getting into fights a lot? Um, I was raised sort of in the shadow of Dr. Martin Luther King's philosophy and protest, you know, especially in the deep south. So my parents were deeply pacifistic, nonviolent, and that was kind of imparted on me, you know, not because not only because I was not, you know, trained as a as a boxer or a fighter or anything, but also just sort of like always turn the other cheek, defuse, walk away. So yeah, I only got punched in the face once, I think. But <laughs> I definitely had to to uh, uh, dodge and duck and dive to sort of stay out of scrapes many times, even up into, you know, uh, senior year in high school. I think the whole football team was threatening to physically remove my hair at one point. They wanted to tie me down and cut my hair. And this was sort of like a, a plot that got hatched that even got it made it up to the headmaster of the school. And his response was like, uh, well, if you guys do that, uh, don't do it on campus. Just don't do like, it on campus. Oh. Right, right, right. Hey, well, you're, you're thanks getting for the protection. <laughs> you, it doesn't surprise me. You getting punched in the mouth once. That's one less than than me. I, I, I always kind of thought that kids maybe picked fights with me because I was into music, uh, because, you know, when mm. we had opportunities to wear what we wanted, you know, I let everybody know that I was into music, you yeah, know, you, you, you show up with your, your Zeppelin shirt on, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, which the teachers right, right. certainly did not like for sure. So you, when you were, you were talking in your book in, uh, at Baylor, it, it kind of stunting your early skills with talking to girls as well. Um, oh, so yeah. well, you're, you're, you're completely removed from half of society, right? You know, for five years, you, there's no way to, to develop those social skills at that time, you know? Right, right. Yeah. So it sounds like your experience was, you know, was pretty similar. I know when I got to high school, I was a little behind on just being around, you know, girls on a regular basis. So yeah. I had to shed a lot of that fight or flight mentality I developed as a young kid and learn to, you know, just relax a little bit. And that's really why I dove headfirst into music. And so it's just really 
interesting to me how you got into it. So um, talking about your mom, your, your mom was pretty revolutionary. Uh, she struck me as really yeah, interesting, very forward thinking, wasn't she? Yeah, she was a she was a real lefty activist. She was president of the local National Organization of Women, local ACLU, you know, very much into you know, marching in the streets, protest kind of person uh, raised in New York City, you know, in the housing projects in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Married my dad in 1960, 61, moved to Tennessee and just be, immersed herself in sort of lefty politics in the deep South in the 60s. If you can imagine right. what that must have been. No, like. I can't. No. Yeah. And she worked things out with your school as a kid to where you were allowed to leave the class during Bible study? Well, again, she was president of the local ACLU, and that was right. a big test case for them was in Tennessee was the, you know, ACLU versus the the Board of Education of Tennessee or I forget Hamilton County, whatever it was. Right. So one of the one of the victories, quote unquote, was like, you know, they had to obtain parental permission they had to send permission slips home with all of the kids before the Bible teacher could come into a public school class. Mm -hmm. You know, the separation of church and state. This is a, a, a constitutional issue, as they saw it at the time. And uh, of course, you know, everyone sent back the permission slips and said, yes, you know, my child can study the Bible, except for guess who? So it became, you know, they would pluck me out like Ivan, you come out. So it made sort of an example of me like, you know, you had, I had to get up and leave the classroom. Well, when the Bible teacher came in, but the good news there was they had to teach me something else. So one teacher like took me, I think there was maybe one other student for maybe one year, but mostly it was just me. So they, I, they took me to the school cafeteria and they taught me uh, basically like map reading, like cartography, like how to how to how to navigate. And, you know, as a touring musician now, like that's the life skill set that served me to this day. You know, thank thank God I got to learn how to read maps when I was, you know, 11 years old. Yeah, it's helpful, right? It's really yeah, helpful. Um, 100%. I, I wanted to touch upon the topic of loneliness. You talk about this in your book, yeah. and this chapter really, uh, it made me sit up while I was reading. Um, when describing your photo album that contains pictures with uh, all the people that you met and played with over the years, you mentioned that much of that photo album or, or photo gallery is, in your words, a, a testament to the fact that having low self-esteem makes me think I can't be interesting on my own. I think it's important, Ivan, to talk about loneliness. I think we all feel it at some points. I know I do, especially when we were in quarantine last year. But how do you? How did so, you? So tough. Personally, cope with it. <clears throat> Talk to me about that, if you don't mind. Uh, well, you know that's a that's a different story depending on sort of what phase in my life you're talking about. You know, like in, in high school, I was very isolated. You know, I, I found sort of some community through the theater program, but I didn't have like friends that I ran around with at all until maybe maybe my senior year. And what you were also saying, like sort of like um, some of the acceptance that I did find among my peers was through music because I actually played at a talent show in front of them and they we, we had a, a great gig. So like so they sort of accepted me on that kind of level. Um, but no, I was just I was, you know, to this day, I'm kind of a lone wolf. You know, when I've learned sort of the key to happiness on the road is not necessarily sharing a station wagon with six other guys, you know, right. <laughs> the more time you can sort of be on your own. Uh, the better uh, attitude you'll have when you run into a sound check, you know, like uh, I, I, I embrace it on a, on a one level and another level, you know, I don't take it as like some sort of personal failure that I don't have, you know, a, um, uh, a group of friends like Elvis did with the Memphis mafia. Like he always had to have 12 guys around him at all right. time. Like he had right. to have his posse with him all the time. So I, I definitely don't have that and don't need that. But, and, and I think it's mostly to my benefit rather than detriment, even though there have been some drastically long periods of time where I was like, yeah, I felt very alone in the world, you know? Yeah, you, you also talk in your book or you write in your books, uh, your, your stories run the gamut from inspiring to horrifying. Uh, <laughs> mostly I have to laugh to keep from crying. It's been a long drive yeah. past an infinite freak show of roadside attractions. <laughs> Can you talk to me about some of the, the horrifying things that you've seen out on the road? Well, horrifying. I don't know if horrifying is the always the word, you know, a lot of weird, really just weird, weird, weird stuff. You know, like uh, I think I detailed in the book the whole story about what I called the Hannibal Lecter wedding. Right. Where we played we played a wedding for zero guests. It was just the couple. It was this giant, elaborate hundred thousand right. right. dollar right. Right. affair with lighting and flower uh, flowers and, and catering and the whole thing and nobody there. 
yeah. in, in a in a gothic uh, a, a gothic synagogue in New York, and like this little jazz trio sort of quietly in the corner playing for like four hours. It was the weirdest, most unsettling thing. And the reason I called it, we 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 nicknamed it the Hannibal Lecter wedding because we would not have been surprised if we read in the New York Times the next day, yes, the, the bride <laughs> was eaten by the groom on her wedding night because <laughs> it was so odd, it was so bizarre. Like you can't. You couldn't have described that. You like you couldn't make something like that up. You just you know you had to see something like that to to believe that it's a real thing. You know. And I, and I want the listeners here to you know to pick up your book and learn more about this, but to leave a few teasers. We'll do that a few times here. But you also described an experience where you played a gig for what you guys thought in New Jersey was very likely, but not one hundred percent sure, a uh, potential high member of the mafia. Well, we, 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 we can't say that, but we, we, we call them, you know, legitimate businessmen who may or may not right. have been involved in the, uh, in the garbage collection industry. Hard to say. <laughs> we have no confirmation nor denial. But I will say that sort of when you were in the environment, you kind of got the vibe. You're like, oh, I think I know where we are. Don't make <laughs> eye contact with anybody. And, and you know, and, and gentlemen of that sort of ilk, be they involved in, you know, whatever em enterprises they are, legal or otherwise, tend to surround themselves with, you know, very um, attractive, nubile young women in various states of uh, undress. And the, 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 the deal was like, just don't make eye contact with anybody. Right. Don't look at anybody. Just keep your head down, play your job, you know, keep with a smile on your face and your eyes down and look at the paper and leave the premises and get your paycheck and go home. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I want to tell the listeners too, like there's so much more to that story and I, I, I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> I want them to pick up the book so they can read it, but it was definitely one of the most interesting uh, chapters just as far well, the, as some of the, the kind of quote, we can, unquote, horrifying things you've yeah, seen. Yeah, no, the teaser we can give them, we, uh, and I won't say any more about it other than the fact I'm pretty sure I was going to die there that evening. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was going to be my final resting place, and I won't tell you anymore. It's all in the book. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, not to harp too much, going back to loneliness a little bit, but the yeah. loneliness topic just always interests me. I yeah. think it's important to discuss this because I, I truly believe out there that people who are in the music industry or live like a rock star, they, or who don't, excuse me, they think that, you know, the, the musician life is just all sex, drugs, and rock and roll all the time. Right. But the truth right. is, Ivan, it's really, really hard work. C yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I'll summarize it by saying, you know, and I, I, I say this to a lot of people too, when, when sort of asked with the same sort of questions, like, I, I'll do the gig for free. Playing music is what I love to do. I will do the gig for free. Um, Monday evening, this is coming up in, in four days now, right? I'm getting on a flight at 5.20 p.m. and I'm flying to Siena, Italy. I'm flying to Rome, Italy. I gotta rent a car, meet the band, drive to Siena, Italy, which is about two and a half hours. Um, get the band to sound check at 10 o'clock in the morning. After sound check, I gotta get them all, we all have to have mandatory COVID tests so we can be able to get on a plane to come back to the States. You know, like there's all these logistics. It's a lot of potential trip wires, things that could really go wrong and strand us, you know, in a foreign right. country kind of thing. And that's, that's what I get paid for. I get paid for the travel and the logistics and the pain in my behind for sitting on an airplane for seven hours. You know, I'm six foot five. I don't fit and coach very easily, you know, so <laughs> It's it physically pains me to sit on an airplane for that long. So I usually stand up like back in the galley, just just standing much to the dismay of the flight crew who, who want to talk to me and find out uh, what band are you in. <laughs> Going to the bathroom but, in an airplane must be just a nightmare. You know, you gotta you gotta hold on to the little handhold and you know. I mean, I was just in a I was just in a plane to Nashville last week and I could barely stand it and I'm five ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're a little tight, a little tight in here. You know. <laughs> so so, so that's when I. Yeah, that's what I say, though. I get paid for the logistics and the travel. You know, the gig is free. That's the gigs on me. But all the rest of it, that's what you got to pay me for. Now, is that what you were kind of referring to in chapter two when you say, you know, what then is the payoff? It, is that the payoff, the gig? I think so. Yeah. I mean, again, sort of as I've done this for close to 30 years now professionally, like uh, what I realize over and over again, and, and it, it surprises me over and over again, like this week, in particular, I'm dealing with two wedding gigs, uh, a nightclub job, um, 
a Broadway thing I'm doing on Monday. Like it's it's just like it's it's all this disparate sort of material that I'm trying to just keep all my ducks in a row and keep focused and try to show up at the right gig with the right thing and the right time, you know. Um, but all I really what I find out over and over again is when I get up there, what I like is the performing, the playing. That's what I like to do, you know. So the rest of it is just sort of the hard work that you have to do to be able to be allowed to, you know, play music, the music of the Temptations on Broadway, which is what I'll be doing Monday morning for a press event, it just turns out, you know, and that's oh, a great joy to me, like, you know, playing yeah. th that book of music, all the original Motown stuff and the original Motown bo bass lines, you know, I find that just enormously entertaining and joyous to do, to be able to do getting there to go get my mandatory COVID test and send in my vaccine card and take the subway and take slap all my gear and go directly from the that event to the airport JFK with all my gear for the week like I'm gonna be traveling with 60 pounds of gear around my shoulders you know that's what you're paying me for that stuff right you know? right so it's true that you'd rather be playing a four-hour gig starting at midnight for 40 bucks than sitting on a couch watching movies yeah. I think you said in your book and I came to yeah. the the very same crossroads that you possibly did, Ivan. Mine was in 2002. I was gigging weekly at a place in Boston. And one night after a solo gig, uh, I was playing in front of maybe two people at 11.30 p.m. on a Monday night. Right. I was riding the, the, the tea back to my apartment in Brookline, realizing that I had to get up from my day job in less than six hours and thinking right yeah. there at that moment, I don't know if I can go on like this. Did you ever have that voice <laughs> in your head telling you something like that? I have it every day. I've had that today. <laughs> How, do through, How do you push well, through? How do you push through? The way I push through is like, to, to, I was thinking that this, this very morning, I was thinking like, you know what? The logistics involved with me trying to organize these songs and, and the set list and communicate with the singers and see who can do what and what key for this wedding I'm doing on Saturday. I'm not enjoying this part. This is yeah. not the fun part, you know? Right. So the fun part will be when we're actually playing four hours, you know, nonstop on Saturday. That'll be the fun <laughs> part. But yeah, oh. no, it, every day. But the, the way I persevere is because I'm booked. I already accepted the job, you know, and I right. knew what the parameters were going in. So now I have to push through. And also because of the pandemic, because we were shut down for almost a year and a half. Like, right. I, not that I said no to many things before. I P.S. I never did. But now I really don't. So, you know, so now I'm double booked and now I'm triple booked, you know, so I'm, I'm working uh, Friday, Saturday, two on, you know, one on Monday and then flying internationally in the same day. You know, that's it's a lot. It's a lot to do. And and Saturday, the, the gig is up, you know, on um, almost on Cape Cod, actually, Mattaquasset, Mass. So ah, I'm driving yeah. up and back, which is like four hours each direction on either side of the gig. You know, so I'm getting in the car probably 1130 and heading back to New York. Uh, those are some hard road miles, you know, like that's not the fun part at all. You see everybody out there listening. It's not all glitz and glam. <laughs> Ivan is not doing this for his health. He's doing it because he loves it. <laughs> and that's a, that's a breed that yeah, I think, I think musicians, they get to that crossroad and it's like, I'm either going to do this or I'm not, I'm either all in or, you know, I'm all out. Right. And, um, and that's what I admire about you, man. So, all right, getting to some of the juicy stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, could you tell me, tell me about your experience playing with sting years ago? What was that like? Uh, you know, one of my all time heroes, you know, one of the great singer songwriter musicians of our age yeah. uh, you know, uh the the talent show i mentioned in high school when i was uh 17 years old we played police covers we played rush and police and who and stones and that kind of thing you know tommy two-tone i think we played i can't, can't remember who else uh you know so like message in a bottle that was one of the one of the songs that we played so fast forward 27 years or something like that. I start working with Sam Moore from Sam and Dave. Right. I became his music director uh, in 2003. In 2006, he did an all-star duets album that came out on Rhino slash Warner Brothers Records. And he had duet partners on this album that included, stop me anytime, Bruce Springsteen, Sting, Winona Judd, uh, Mariah Carey, Paul Rogers from Bad Company, um, and on and on. So when it came time to promote this record, uh, they tried to see if some of the duet partners would come by and sing a song. And <laughs> lo and behold, Sting came in. You know, he, he recorded the song None of Us Are Free with Sam as a duet. And um, the first time we met him, I've worked with him. Uh, I've certainly been in his, in his orbit about 
three or four times. Uh, I'm trying to think, I probably had a base on two or three of those three or four times. So yeah, so we did, a, it, was, it was a film for a, a PBS thing in, in a small nightclub in, in Manhattan. And we, you know, we just, we were suddenly in the same band together, you know, and he was just singing and I was playing bass for Sting. And it was just kind of like, it was one of these kind of pinch yourself sort of moments. Like, how did I get here from the gymnasium at the Baylor school, right? you know, playing, playing message in a bottle. And then um, we saw him a couple other times with Sam, always with Sam. Sam was, Sam's the, the catalyst for all of this stuff. Now, for those of um, you, sorry to cut you, I just want to, for those of you not yeah. familiar with Sam Moore, he's the guy from the famous R&B group, Sam and Dave, that recorded yes. and gigged throughout the entire 60s and 70s. He's a rock and roll hall of fame inductee. Now, I, yeah, I cut you off a little Sam. bit there. I apologize. Yeah, Tell yeah, me more. No worries. But that, you're exactly right. So Sam from Sam and Dave was my boss. You know, I toured with him on the road for 13 years. And that's how we met Sting. Um, also, just to sort of put Sam in context, you know, he was he's a true first tenor. He's got this amazing instrument and he came before sort of all these other big rock stars. So standing next to Sam in my travels, just, you know, I was introduced to and would shake hands and he was Sam would say, this is my music director, Ivan. This is Robert Plant. This is Bruce Springsteen. This is Sting. This is Elvis Costello. This is Bono. This is The Edge. You know, uh, this is Robert Plant. All these people would come up to Sam with no ego at all. Like they were coming like right. almost on bended knee, r revering him right. as, you know, the, the amazing person he was. And again, Sting was one of these guys. So uh, fast forward a little bit more, 2009 was the very first Obama inauguration ball. Um, and we played, uh, it was a, an event put on by the Creative Coalition, which was a, a big group of Hollywood kind of elites who were sort of dabbling in politics at the time. And they had a, the Creative Coalition Ball in Washington, D.C., uh, featuring uh, um, entertainment by the Sam Moore Band with special guests Elvis Costello and Sting. So once again, we're put on, on the spot and we're, we're going to back up Sting. He's going to sing a duet with Sam and he's going to do a couple songs on his own with us backing him up. So we knew he was going to do uh, Every Breath You Take. So I had the charts, had the band all ready to do Every Breath You Take. And then we knew he was going to do Message in a Bottle as a solo thing, a, a guitar and voice, kind of famously like he did on the Secret Policeman's Other Ball, that fundraiser album that came out in like 81. Yep. There's a famous version of him playing it solo. So he told us he was going to do that. So we, everything went really well when we rehearsed uh, Every Breath You Take. And uh, I said, you're going to do Message, right? He said, yeah. I, I said, do you want us to, to back you up on that as well? And he said, you know, and I'm like, C sharp, right? He's like, yeah. <laughs> so suddenly, because I'd played it in high school when I was 17, like, you know, 27 years later, I'm playing it on stage in front of like this crazy guest list of Hollywood elites, you know, and I'm, and I'm just sitting there just kind of like trying to, stay focused and stay in my body, you know, not having too much of a fanboy moment, you know, backing up my childhood hero, literally, you know. And what happens to you when you experience the roar of that, of the crowd? Like, what's that feeling like? Well, you know, there's no feeling quite like it, but at the same time, you know, the roar is for Sting and it's for Sam. It's not for right. me, right? you right. know, and my but job you're contributing is to that. You're contributing I, to that, right? I am. But I, I know am. And I'm, and I'm conducting the band, you know, and I'm keeping everything and I'm, and I'm trying to make it my job as a music director is to make it comfortable for Sam and Sting and his special guests to do their show and not have to worry about the band. Like we got you. We, you know, right. we we're just like we're like, like a big life raft on the ocean so they right. can go out there and do what they do, you know. But also while this raucous applause is going on, my job is to sort of like be getting the band onto the page for the next song and reading the applause of the audience and knowing like just after it peaks, that's when I need to start counting to get into the next song sort of thing. So right. I have like, you know, physical, uh, uh, mechanical things going on in my mind that sort of don't allow me to fully, you know, just sort of stand on stage and smile and, and just bow for the applause. I, I got other things to think about at that point. Yeah. Which uh, helps keep me focused. It helps keep yeah. me on my game, you know. I wanted to talk a little bit about sly too from sly and the family stone you played mm, on the same yeah. bill as sly at least once right or was it twice we played on the same bill one time and then i have a separate sly related uh experience with greg Arico, the original drummer from the family Stone. so we did play with greg we did a woodstock 50th thing and we played the whole woodstock sly set with the original drummer which was a huge thrill a huge thrill but yeah that we were only on the on the bill with him it was at the tokyo jazz fest in i think 2009 um 
uh, Robin Ford played before us, mm -hmm. and then it was the Sam Moore band, and then Sly and the Family Stone, featuring um, Cynthia and Jerry were there. Sly, Sister Rose were also four. Of the originals were there uh, on stage, and tremendous, like uh, beautiful and horrible to 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 uh, observe at the same time. Because he was, you know, he's kind of chewed up these days. You know, he's he's aged, and and there are possibly some recreational chemicals in his history possibly you know, yeah possibly. there's a possibility there may be daily usage i don't know i've heard i don't know but you know he's a little <laughs> you wrote in your book I a, up. you you wrote in yeah, your yeah. book it was unlikely that he had just come from a gym or a health food store <laughs> unlikely unlikely he's, he's definitely the worst for wear and tear and i don't know how he got the wear and tear i can guess yeah. You know, but yeah, so it, it was beautiful and terrible to behold because he would kind of, he's kind of hunched over and he kind of shuffled out on stage and flopped down at the keyboard. But when he started to sing, you're like, oh, that, that's Sly Stone. That's him. Right, right. It's the voice, you know, and the guy, and the guy who created all of this music, you know, the guy who wrote it and choreographed it and orchestrated it and hired a multiracial, multi gender, multicultural band in the 60s and then had hit after hit after hit, you know. It's astounding what he did, you know, and to see him in person was, was, you know, goosebumps, really. Now that, I mean, it, it, he was obviously uh, very likely his health decline was, you know, just due to being a victim maybe of the, the road. And it, that w when I was reading that in your book, it made me think, I just recently did a review on the band's last waltz. And what I love about these is I just dive into it for several weeks. And so I just be, mm. I just did nothing but, you know, read, write and watch that, that movie. And I wanted to quote Robbie Robertson from yeah. that concert film when he says the road, it's a goddamn impossible way of life. <laughs> uh, how do you stay healthy both physically and mentally on the road? Uh, it's tough. I, 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 I'm an avid runner, so I've always got my running shoes with me. So like, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I was just thinking about this just now on the train on the way over here to do this interview. I'm going to try and figure out if I can get at least two runs in when I'm in Italy, like oh, when I'm over there. So like when I get there, the day we get there, we're going to, I might be able to get one in the evening and then possibly one in the middle of the day. It's going to be hot as blazes, but I'm going to see if I can do that. So, you know, I, I have a physical exercise regimen. Uh, I've got a crazy restrictive sort of diet that's voluntary just for my own personal misery. But uh, <laughs> I don't know if that necessarily, you know, because a lot of it's genetics. Sure. You know, it's like your your body type and body size is just going to it's going to be what it's going to be to a, to a large extent. But, you know, I, I, I definitely don't overdo it with the with the carbs and all that kind of stuff. I try to keep that in check as much as possible. In my advancing years, you know, I was much more liberal about these things when I was younger, but now I'm having to watch it a right? bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you have to babysit yourself a little bit more. A little, a little bit. bit. <laughs> a little bit. You, you worked with Solomon Burke as well, and I wanted to touch upon that. It, Solomon yeah. was a, a gospel country rhythm and blues singer, and he wasn't maybe to the pop community. He wasn't as known as maybe, say, like James Brown or Otis Redding, but Solomon was right. responsible for inf uh, influencing countless musicians and i i think one of them that i saw was mick jagger mick, mick recorded yes. several of, of solomon's songs on early rolling stones records so 100%. you toured with with solomon you played in his band many many times yeah tell me about that that story i don't want you to give the whole thing up because i want people to <laughs> to buy your book but it's it's documented that many people have witnessed solomon selling sandwiches to his own band members on overnight bus rides yeah, I never did the overnight bus rides with him, but uh, he was a businessman. Let's put it that way. He was a businessman. <laughs> he had several different business ventures. He was a licensed mortician. He had a, a string of funeral homes. He was a musician. He had uh, the famous story was at, at the Apollo Theater. He was booked to play and he said, all right, I'll play if you can give me all the concessions. And they said, sure, you can have concessions. No problem. So by which concessions they thought he meant they thought he was going to sell T-shirts and albums or whatever, you know, and he thought concessions mean I'm gonna sell popcorn. So he like <laughs> took over the food concession, you know, and it was a big, it was a big whoop de doo. Uh, again, that was sort of before my time with him. But I, I saw him do some some crazy things, and I also was very acutely aware that our band leader, Crispin Seo from the Uptown Horns, needed to, uh, as Solomon was finally exiting the stage at the end of the of the show for the bows and thank you very much. He's blowing kisses to the audience and he's handing roses to the ladies in the front row and the whole thing. As he's going off to the stage. Right in lockstep behind him was Crispin, and he needed to go and be with him in the dressing room immediately because if that didn't happen, 
there was a, a high probability that our payment for the evening might leave you know he might just you know get in the car and go and we wouldn't get paid <laughs> yeah and Crispin yeah. knew this because he he dealt with him previously so he had you know he, he came up through the chitlin circuit and the chitlin circuit mentality back in the day was sort of like you know i'm going to get you before you're going to get me because right. everybody was out to get over as much as they could uh, you know and people that grew up in that sort of kind of carry that mentality forward even when it no longer seemed necessary. And I, I think he was one of those sort of old school, old soul Chitlin Circuit people. Uh, Explain the Chitlin Circuit to me. Chitlin like, what Circuit is that, was the origin of that, of that word. That was the uh, network of uh, nightclubs uh, where uh, African-American artists were allowed to perform. Okay. I sort of, you know, it, this I've read books about it, and it seems to have started kind of in uh, Indianapolis, actually, because uh -huh. there was like a booking agent who started keeping lists of clubs that would book the black artists. But not only that, especially when you're going through the South, you also had to know where rooming houses or hotels were that black people could stay at because it right. was not universally allowable. Right. You had to know where the restaurants were you could eat at, you know, that kind of thing. So it was a whole mentality and a whole touring circuit that was completely different from you know the white world it was a very segregated kind of thing so a lot of the classic soul artists had to come up through that 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 system the chitlin circuit they called it uh, and again like as things became more integrated and more crossover you know they may or may not have been able to get out of that as a circuit and also as as a as a way of doing business as a like i said like that sort of mentality about i'm going to get you before you get me right kind of that right. that's hard to sort of like mature out of in a way you know what i mean because i would agree with you i think that was part of how i was raised like don't you yeah. know don't let them ever see a sweat they're gonna right. they're you know don't trust anybody they're gonna get you so you better get them first um, and there are legendary stories in the business I, i've never worked with chuck berry but he's very famous to have demanded cash payment before he appears on stage right. his entire career. Right. He would not go on unless he had whatever his fee was in a suitcase in his hand. Right. As soon as right. he had that, then he would go on stage. And, and when he came back off stage, if you wanted an encore, there was a bonus <laughs> in cash in his hand. Right. Right. It had to be in his hand or he's not going back out. You know what right. I'm saying? So like, right. that's from that, that sort of the Chitlin circuit mentality, you know, like the club owner would, you know, after you've done the performance, they don't need you anymore. So your bargaining power goes down to zero, you know, so that's, you know, he, he would, he knew to negotiate. You want me to go back on? Here's the money. Give me the money. Right, now. Right, <laughs> right. With, with Solomon, you, you, there was a great story and I want, I want to let you tell it, but the, he made one time the entire band minus you, luckily uh, meet him at LAX for a trip to a gig to <laughs> NYC. Yeah, but did. instead of getting them plane tickets, uh, okay, what what happened next? All right. So it wasn't the whole band. It was just, uh, I think it was five or six horn players. Because uh, the gig we ended up doing had 10 horns on it. Because the band I was in, the Uptown Horns, had four horns. And then he brought six more. So it was, there were 10 horns on the stage. So I think five or six of them were from, I think one of them might have been a sax player from Boston who was also his lawyer or something, but there was so at least five of them were LA cats. And he said, all right, we got a gig in New York. We're playing Central Park. Meet me at LAX. So they all show up at LAX. And he said, great. We're going to have a gig in New York. Look forward to this. There's your van waiting out by the curb. He rented him a van, said, you're driving, I'm flying. And he got in the, in the plane and, and they, unbeknownst to them, they had no idea that they were driving across country nonstop taking drive taking you know turns and shifts driving to get to this gig because when they pulled up to behind the stage in central park they they were none the worse for wear and tear <laughs> they were they were looking pretty warm i can't imagine what that ride must have been like and the shock that they had because it the way you made it sound in your book was they got to the airport and they thought they were getting on a plane well, you know, when an artist tells you to meet them at the airport, it's generally a safe assumption, you know, like, why would you meet it in the airport unless you were getting on a plane, not into a van? Otherwise, you would say, meet me at Avis Rent-A-Car, you know, right. if we're doing that kind of thing. Right. So, yeah, they were they were shocked. So none of them had packed for the, the six days round trip it was going to take them or five days, whatever it was going to take. Yeah. You know, they, they just thought they were coming for a one nighter in, in New York City. Oh, were they wrong? Oh, <laughs> now, you were talking earlier about uh, different artists, especially on the, the Chitlin circuit, wanting to get paid up front. You know, yeah. 
in, in terms of, of you, did you ever get screwed out of pay for any gigs? Very little. I've been very lucky in that regard. Um, I've had some people come close. I've had some people like really pull some shenanigans uh, for me. Uh, I had a, a, a $400 check from uh, a manager of a certain Motown artist who shall remain nameless. And I, I was told to hold on to the check. Like, don't cash it yet. Like, what, <laughs> what does that mean? Like, when do I cash it? We, we did the gig already. And uh, I had to chase that check for many, many, many months. It wasn't, it wasn't like weeks. It was months and months. I don't think it was quite a year, but eventually they ended up cutting me a different check and said, you know, just get rid of the last one. And I think I have it still in a drawer somewhere because it was completely <laughs> worthless piece of paper. Uh, but the only reason they paid me for that job was because they needed me for the next one. Right. And that happens a lot. Sort of like, you you kind of like your, again, your bargaining power is that, oh, you need me to show up in Minneapolis? Well, you didn't pay me for Phoenix, so why am I going to show up in Minneapolis? Exactly. Oh, 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 yeah, no, no, we, yeah, yeah, there's a check. Yeah, yeah, we got that. It's coming. Yeah, and then, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah, yeah. This one I've been dying to ask you about. Yeah. Tell me about your experience at the O2 Arena in 07 being on the side of the stage for what sounded mm. like a couple seconds at the Led Zeppelin reunion show. I was there. No, I was more than a couple seconds. I probably watched them for a good 20, 25 minutes or something like oh, that. Oh, my you know. gosh. So the story was we were playing the after party. This was the Ahmet Erdogan tribute gig. You know, when Ahmet passed, you know, all the former Atlantic artists got together at the O2 Arena. Uh, and it was a huge all-star bill, you know, and this is their 20,000 seat arena. It's kind of their London's version of Madison Square Garden kind of thing. Um, and all these Atlantic artists, legacy artists, and the headliner was a band from England called Led Zeppelin who had not played together since I think the Atlantic 40th reunion in the in 86 was that was that when atlantic 40th was <sighs> nebworth but that was obviously after john died but i think jason played with them uh but nebworth was early 90s late 80s so, okay, so you might be right you you would probably know uh, you would probably know better than i would but they didn't this, reunite very much i mean this no, was no, once or twice is, this, since bottom right died. this this, this might have been their second or third gig since 1980 right right so exactly yeah so it was a big show jason was there he was amazing so we what i why i was there because i was playing the after party for that event and I don't know if you know Madison Square Garden, but there's a the big arena theater. And then beneath it, there's a, a smaller theater called, it used to be called the Felt Forum. Now I think it's called the theater at Madison Square Garden or something. Um, it's a tiny venue. It's only 5,000 seater. You know, it's a small one. Uh, so at the O2 Arena has, you know, 20,000 seater. That's the main room. And then uh, they have a side venue called the Indigo Club, which I think is, again, a tiny one. Only 2,500, you know, only 2,500 of your closest friends can fit into it. So the, the after party was the house band was Bill Wyman and his Kings of Rhythm. Uh, and the feature performers were Sam Moore from Sam and Dave, my boss, uh, Percy Sledge, Benny King and Solomon Burke. Uh, I was there only with Sam. I only played with Sam that night, even though I played with all, all four of them many times over the years. And I got to certainly hang out with them backstage and visit. Um, I kicked Bill Wyman off the base like, Bill, I got this. Don't worry. <laughs> I you got know. it, Bill. <laughs> Got to take a rest. You know, I said, can we get a photo together, Bill? He said, if you'll kneel down, because he's, you know, he's a short gentleman. Right. Uh, so, and, and the, but the thing about this gig, it was so celebrity star studded. If you can imagine the guest list for people, you know, the only time Led Zeppelin has played or the third time in 40 years, the guest list is huge for this thing. And there's some gigantic stars just in the audience. So the credentials, the laminate passes you had to have to get back to various uh, uh, theory uh, uh, areas of the of the performance venue. For instance, like we were playing with uh, um, Sam Moore and we were uh, Paul Rogers from Bad Company was going to sing the duet that he sang with Sam on the album that I talked about earlier. So Paul was going to come perform with us and he didn't have the right laminate pass to get back to where we were to do his gig. So in other words, Paul Rogers from Bad Company was being denied entrance <laughs> to his own performance. This is the level of security that was at this thing, right? So I've got a laminated pass which says Indigo After Party All Access, right? So I'm good for the 2,500 seat theater. I have no idea if I have any juice to get into the 20,000 seater at all. Right. So I just hung the laminate around my neck and I started walking. I said, let me see how far I can get with this thing. And I think that the secret was, in retrospect, I think what I figured out was 
I had access to catering, which was in the 20,000 seater, like it was under, you know, backstage. At so I think I had access to catering. So what it allowed me to do is I just kept walking past checkpoint, past checkpoint, past checkpoint. They just look at the laminate, say, yeah, go through. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm I can't believe this is happening. This is working. So I go through a door, another door past, you know, again, security. I, I can't tell you how many checkpoints there were. So this, you know, I walk through a door and the guy, you know, waves me in and I'm in this walkway and I freeze because I am uh, 30 feet from John Paul Jones's ass. Like I'm in a walkway on the side of the stage, basically. And there's a security guard who is this giant mountain of a human being who on the side of the, on the very skirt of the stage, who's only going to let four people on that stage. There's nobody else coming up there. I don't care who you are. Right. Like, so I'm just looking at him and I've got my laminate and I'm just standing here. I'm going like, I'm not sure how I got here. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be here. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to be here, but I'm not moving. I'm standing right here and I'm going to watch Led Zeppelin <laughs> and I'm watching for a song or two. And suddenly I feel a tap on my shoulder. I'm like, Oh no, that's it. <laughs> The jig is up. I'm out. And the guy is a security guard. He says, you can't stand here. This is an active walkway. You have to stand here. And he pushes me closer behind the barricade. So now I'm 15 feet <laughs> from John Paul Jones's ass. And I'm watching him play the organ and play, watch him play Daisy and Fuse. And I'm going is that like, what I was going to ask you? Is that what yeah. they were playing at the time? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. And I'm like, oh, boy, this is good. <laughs> this is good seats. Wow. You know, and I was there. I was there for less than a half hour, probably 25 minutes, because I, I think I had to get back to work, you know, doing something. And then you had to do a gig after the show, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah you know, our, yeah. our gig started at like midnight, 1 a.m. I think we right. started, you know, it was the after after party, you know. Right, so, right, right. Amazing story. So in, in contrast to being a session musician, Ivan, did you ever just want to be a part of, you know, one band? I mean, I know you were. Uh, a bunch of times. And, and I know you gig and travel a lot now with, uh, I think you said humble pie. That's right. That's yeah, right yeah. But ha have you ever yearned for that sort of one home, so to speak? Well, I mean, yes and no, because I, I feel like, you know, I love having the consistency that comes with playing the same gig night after night, because only through that, through like, you know, the collective experience you have with one another can the music really grow and expand and they improvise and you can come up with arrangements like you know just by doing it over and over again and that's a great thing when that is able to happen but that said there are very few gigs that can pay all of the rent you know so even right. the humble pie gig you know in 2018 2019 we did about a month each of those years or in the fall we did a month on the road tremendous the most fun you know you can imagine and then you're home, you know, you got another 11 months of rent to pay, right? But you got to be doing something else, right? Um, so the one notable exception with that would be like, if you got a job in a Broadway pit, you know, if you're right. playing eight shows a week, that can certainly pay all the rent by itself. But even the weddings, you know, you know, doing wedding gigs, you're, you're working Saturday nights only, you've got another six nights of the week to, to fill in and the wedding is not quite enough to pay all the rent. So you're gonna have to, you have to be diverse you have to diversify your portfolio to sort of keep the bills paid so yes i'd love that but in practical reality i know that that's not always um feasible financially or physically you know right right now you, you come off in your book as a really humble person ivan and despite all of your success and experiences that you've had all lies, and all lies. <laughs> now uh, I'm not blowing sunshine up your wazoo here. This is not Oprah trying to tell her audience that Tom Cruise is a really humble guy. No, uh -huh. um, but in many of your interactions with other celebrities, you seem to be surprised if they remember you. Your, your book has this yeah. kind of narrative, somewhat small narrative, but a narrative that, you know, you see yourself as kind of that quiet ghost in the background when in many ways you are no ghost, man. You, you, you also say people come up to you all the time and, reminisce about a time when they met you and you don't even remember that or the gig. So <laughs> I guess, do, do you think that that's just part of being a traveling musician? Do you just meet so many people that it's impossible yeah. to keep track of everyone? It, it is, it is. And I, and I've, I've observed it from being around my famous friends. You know, when, you, when right. you're around famous people, you, you see that like really as an observer, like for instance, uh, I'm sorry to drop a name. I'll pick it up later, but <laughs> Stanley Clark is, a, is an old, old friend of mine. I've been working with him. I worked at his record label. I've known him for 35 years. He's been a teacher. He's been a mentor. He's been a friend. I've just been around him a lot you know, over the years. That's the point of the story. Not to say that I know Stanley Clark, I don't, you know, not, not dropping the name. But what happens is when you see him at a concert venue, when he's backstage at a venue, 
suddenly that's when everybody's energy in the room is they're coming at him like, hey, Stanley, hey, Stanley, sign this. Uh, you met my cousin. Uh, take a picture, you know, this kind of thing. So like in that environment, I kind of watch him sort of like go into self-protection mode. He kind of like, right. <laughs> He kind right. of goes into a little shell and he, he, he becomes, uh, I, I love when he does this too, he becomes like selectively hard of hearing. So somebody <laughs> says like, hey Stanley, you know, do you remember playing in, in Maryland in, in uh, 1981? He goes, huh? You know, his first right. reaction is like, what? You right, know? right. And, and it's, it's strictly self-preservation. And then, it, you know, as soon as we leave the, the concert venue, Stanley, as famous as he is among musicians, he's not that wildly famous you know he's not like a, a, a matt damon famous you know right. like he can walk down the street of new york city and and most people aren't going to bother him or, or necessarily general public might not know who he is right so that fame kind of he, he i watch him sort of go in and out of that sort of thing and then in my own experience like you know uh, because i'm the bass player we're kind of in the back we're a little bit more uh laid back we're not you know grabbing the spotlight so much but for instance, like when I would sub on the show Rock of Ages on Broadway, the band was on stage uh, in makeup, in costume, doing choreo the whole time, right? And when we come out the stage door, there's like a little scene there, like there's little barricades, so people have their, their playbills, they want their playbills signed, they want to take pictures, and, and you're like famous, quote unquote, famous, you know, for that second when you come out the door. You know, you're famous all the way up until you turn the corner on 8th Avenue. And then you're just immediately back into uh, obscurity again. So like the fame sort of thing, it, it really drifts in and out. So you can't ever sort of think like, yeah, I'm somebody, I know who I am and people know who I am. You know, you, you have to assume that they just don't. Right, right. <laughs> and you're, mostly you're right. Mostly the people, they just don't. So that's why like when somebody does remember me, especially if I've met them briefly and I know them, you know, and they know, they've remembered me, I'm like, oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, great. I, I always feel so embarrassed. I mean, it happens. It's got to happen to you way more. But I just, you know, I, I you know, hey, Greg, blah blah blah, and I'm like, uh, yeah. And and there have been times where, and I'm, yeah. I, I should have just admitted it, but I was, yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah, I remember that. You know, oh, I don't yeah. think it. I don't think it serves you anything to admit it because you know what's <laughs> happened is they've seen you on stage somewhere. They've seen right. you at a gig. They've seen you, right. so they've had an experience with you, and right. you may or may not have, you know, talked to them for two seconds at the end of the gig and not remember. But I always go to like, I always go to, hey man, hey, good to see you. Not yeah. great to meet you. Always right. good, good to, to see, see you. you. You just never use the because word meet, right? Right. I don't know. I can't yeah. remember. Like you know, and uh, it, it is a, a ton of people over the years, yeah. which is not to say that I haven't met you know and remember and have dear dear friends over the years. But you know, if if I've met you once five years ago yeah maybe <laughs> now maybe. one of one of those people could i gotta ask this one because this one was cool to me uh one of those was nico mcbrain there's a picture in your book of you yeah. and nico mcbrain for the, the drummer from iron maiden who's one of my yeah. favorite metal bands i've seen them in concert a, a ton of times T tell me about that what was that uh, what was that interaction like nico's a sweetheart man he's such a cool guy seems like we it. were we were doing again this all goes back to sam moore from sam and dave everything everything goes through everything sam. originates through sam everything originates through sam like half of my career i owe it all to sam and i'll tell him i told him to his face and he he gets mad at me when i say that but uh, <laughs> he, he disavows ever knowing me uh anyway it was a fundraiser we were playing a fundraiser for um a benefit i can't remember cancer homeless i can't remember what it was a big it was a big benefit at the hard rock cafe in hollywood florida big concert venue um, and Sam was sort of to be the featured act at the end of the evening and the celebrity host for the whole thing, because there was also a golf tournament involved with it somehow. The celebrity host was Nico because Nico's like an avid golfer. He lives in South That's Florida. Right. That's right. right. Yeah, exactly. So he was there to sort of like run the celebrity auction. And one of the things they were auctioning off was a Nico McBrain signature uh drum kit you know with the iron maiden logos on the whole thing you know and auctioning it off as played by nico and the reason he was able to say as played by nico is because he sat in with sam to play the drums so people are saying like you know see i'm playing it you can take this home now for a bit of whatever you know right right and it I turns actually, out you know i actually touched this you're right exactly we, we all watched you touch it we saw like, <laughs> we watched you dent the heads uh, so we thought he was going to play a song or two, you know, just to sort of like fulfill the, the celebrity auction kind of thing. But no, he sat in the entire set. We had a second drummer. So we did a two drummer gig and Nico was just like beside himself. He just loved it, you know, playing, playing behind Sam because everybody loves Sam. He's amazing. Yeah. And then 
after the show was over, there was a there's a nightclub in the Hard Rock Casino, and there was a band playing in the in the nightclub. You know, just like a re regular sort of covers band playing. And we kind of all reconvened in, in the bar, you know, after the show. And we're like, you know, hey, you guys mind if we, or they asked us, you guys want to sit in? We're like, yeah, you guys take a break. So all of our bands sat in and Nico wanted to sit in because we were doing like Aretha Franklin covers. Nico, before Iron awesome. Maiden, was in a, he was in a soul band in London. So he played, he grew up playing Eddie Floyd and, and uh, Aretha Franklin and Sam and Dave. That's what he grew up doing. So he loves that music. And he's just like, there's pictures of us playing in the nightclub. Like, you know, he's just like grinning ear to ear, just having a great time. <laughs> so, you know, I only, I played with him twice in the same night and uh, I sent him an email every, every year for his birthday. That's my relationship That's awesome. with Nico. That's and awesome. And then when he was in Madison Square Garden, I think last time he got me tickets and I got to see the show. So before this, you, you also held jobs as a dishwasher and I'm, I'm looking at my list here from your book, a dishwasher, an envelope stuffer, a security guard and a yeah. secretary writing resumes. And then you shifted into more kind of music related jobs, uh, like a, a DJ, you were, you were talking about earlier, a record store clerk. And then you also right. mentioned earlier, uh, a publicist for Epic Sony. I, I was, a. uh, a living color fan in the late eighties, early nineties. Mm, and yeah, you worked too. with them as a publicist, sure right? Yeah. What I was that like? Amazing. Amazing. You know, like, uh, I worked on the vivid album with cult of personality on yeah, it, you know? Yeah. So that was like, they were, that was their introduction to the world. And yep. I was there when it yep. happened. Uh, I saw them before do the you, record. Came do you out. still have that gold record? Yeah. Oh yeah. I have, uh, I have a gold one and a platinum one. They're up here around here somewhere. They're on the wall. So yeah. They're, in fact, the platinum one was the only one that sort of made every move with me ever since the, those days. Like I, when I moved out of LA, I shipped a bunch of stuff to stayed in my dad's attic for literally 30 years, <laughs> including all of my gold records. But the, but the platinum living color one, that was the one that came with me. So that, that has been on the wall of every apartment I've had since 1988, whenever I got that thing. So I just, I happened to be there at ground zero at the time. I, I saw them before the record came out. I knew immediately like, this is a, a major band. Is got Vernon Reed say. is, I mean, Corey is great, Vern, but Vernon is like another level guitar player. Vernon, the, all of them, all of them. Will, like all those guys, you know, and I, I see them to this day. I'm friendly with them when I, when I see them, we kind of look at each other like, man, we've been to the campaigns together, to the wars. <laughs> Cause you right. know, I was, I was there when it happened and, um, I saw it happen. I saw how it happened and, and I was just thrilled to be a part of it. So my job as a publicist was to get them in the newspaper, get them on syndicated radio, get them on TV, you know, appearances, that kind of thing. Right. Uh, and that was the work I was doing with them all through that, the, the life cycle of that record. And then you were talking kind of earlier in our, our interview here that that's a, somewhat around the time when you were just sort of like getting a, a little frustrated or just you were like this this isn't for me i want to really be the musician as opposed to being part of the business because a lot of people would tell you um you don't have to know music to be a part of the business well i I'm famously or famously to me the the vice president of product management for epic records told me to my face in the office he said i don't know anything about music i could be selling soap right but what he did was made huge stars out of Gloria Stefan, Tina Marie, you know, like he just, he knew marketing, man. He knew how to get things packaged and get them out there and get them sold in the marketplace. And he was genius at it. He was a very yeah. successful guy. And I got that and I dig it. And we need those people in the industry, to, you know, cause there's only so much we can do as artists and creating a product, but now somebody else has got to really push it out the door if we want to move some units kind of thing, you know, speaking, uh, speaking in the old paradigm when you used to sell records, but uh, to this day, still, you know, you're selling a, a musical product, however you sell it, be a licensing or whatever, you, you know, you need to have business people that really know what they're doing. But as I got into that and I, and I had all these dealings with all these artists, you know, I realized like, yeah, the marketing aspect of it is not what really interested me. It was the creative aspect. And I was, it was great to be around these musicians, but all these musicians looked at me like as I was the guy behind the desk. The you know. Yeah, not a yeah. not a bass player, you know. Sort of. I, it took me a, a bunch of years of sort of being on the other side of the desk to have them see me. And like when I played with the first time I played with the Uptown Horns band at the Bottom Line in uh, 1994, they had special guests Bernard Fowler from the Rolling Stones, Susie Tyrell from the E Street Band, uh, Peter Wolf from Jay Giles, and uh, guest guitarist uh, Vernon Reed. 
so Vernon and I went from, you know, me, me being on behind the desk to suddenly like I'm, he's playing guitar and I'm playing bass on the same stage within about, you know, 88 to 94, however many years that is, six years later, sort of having that kind of experience with him. And, you know, then my musician, my musician friends who I knew for the business started to accept me sort of as one of them once they realized that I'd gone to school and learned how to actually play. <laughs> now, I, I wish I wish you had written and I wish I had read this book 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, because right. I, from the time I was 12 until I was probably 22, all I could think of was I want to be a musician. I want to just be or I want to be connected to the music industry, industry somehow. And Ivan, I thought that every part of it, I mean, I used to sit up late at night and read you know, read magazines and, you know, circus magazine, hit parader, you name everything. I would, I would study the, the tour sheets in the back of the magazine, like sure. where's Metallica yeah, me going to be this week. And, yeah, and too. your book is just so helpful because it's just such a reality check on what the music industry really is. And mm. it shows just what's, you know, for, for those listeners out there, it just shows what, what such a humble guy he is and that you really can also find really good heartfelt people in the business as well because you all have kind of the same love i think that's right you know i think sort of the people that are mostly successful over over time you know especially session players are are just nice people they're just pleasant people to be around because you know if you think about doing a tour with somebody you're on stage with them for two hours a day right 22 hours you're in the hotel, in the van, whatever, you know, like you, you, you have to be able to deal with that person as, as a personality right. for way more than you have to deal with them as a, as a drummer. You know what I mean? So like having that totally. kind of personality where like, you know, the, the people that are successful, that they're just nice people because they're, they're fun to be around. You'll call a drummer who might not be quite as good, but it's a much better hang on the road. I've seen right. that happen over and over and over again. Totally. It's like, you know, totally. there's, yeah, there's somebody who can probably, you know, play faster or louder or something. But but it, it, if they're no fun to be with you know, <laughs> yeah. in an yeah. airport, you're right. like, nope, no thanks. Yeah. Next. Yeah. Next. yeah. Re reminds me of, you know, dabbling in the corporate world as well. You know, somebody who yeah. might be really good at his or her job, but you go out for a beer with them and you're like, oh God, get me out of here. So right. Right. <laughs> you have another picture in your book of you together with Bono from, from you too. Did you just, yeah. did you just meet Bono for that picture? Did you guys cross paths at a gig or something like that? Once again, Sam Moore, I'm standing next to Sam Moore <laughs> and wherever that was, I can tell you where it was. We were at it wasn't even Sam's gig. We were at the Nice Jazz Festival in France. Ah. We played, I think, the night before the next night. Uh, but we were there standing in the wings watching Wilson Pickett, who was Sam's label mate at Stax. Uh, and then suddenly, like, I'm standing next to Sam, and suddenly I'm standing next to Bono and the Edge. They're just there. I'm like, okay, hey, guys, what's up, you know? And Sam's like, this is my music director. This is Ivan. I'm like, nice to meet you. And our guitar player was there, too. So the guitar player... He said uh, to Bono, I was like, can I get a photo? He said, sure, you can get a photo. So I take the photo. And uh, so as I'm taking the photo, I was like, can I get a photo too? He's like, sure. <laughs> Wraps his hands around my throat. Like in that photo, he's strangling me. <laughs> right, right. You know, and I was just like, you know, <laughs> doing a kind of a, a goofy reaction take to the fact that I'm being strangled by one of the biggest rock stars on the yeah, planet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, right. And that's, that's the photo. You know, I never played with the guy. Uh, I did go on to play his music when I subbed in the pit at Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark on Broadway. That score was by Bono on the Edge, but I never performed with him. And that day, you know, we were both he and and I and Sam Moore were all being fans of Wilson Pickett that day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's just so many stories, and we we just I, I, we can't get to them all uh, in this one conversation. But I wanted to touch upon a few as we're sort of getting closer to to wrapping up here, Ivan. I wanted to switch gears just a little bit because I'm really interested in your opinion uh, and insight on this. You know. The music industry, where do you think it's going today? I guess rather than getting fed music to us and knowing where to go get music today, there's so much music out there, amateurs, professionals. I'm talking to you, right. YouTube. Um, right. How does one get their music out there and, and how does one get noticed? I guess before that, that's a couple of questions, but where do you think the music industry, you know, for somebody, you know, not like you, let's, let's say you're just starting out now, like, what are you thinking? Right. Well, I am starting out now because I'm, I'm existing in the same universe <laughs> that everybody else is. So like, you know, I have a new record out on Color Red Records and, and, and my but you're established. I mean, I'm sorry to cut you yeah. off, but I mean, you're, okay. you're established. You've got 
you've got chops and you know people. And that's not to say that you're, you know, you're special, ha ha ha. But, you know, th- th- it's all about networking and all the work that yeah. you've done up to today, you can use those. I do the same thing in my day job. I use my network to say, yeah. hey, you know, I, can you get me an interview here? Or, hey, can you get right. me this? Um, Fair enough. I'm not, I'm not a rank beginner, certainly, but I, but I also know that I, I have very little marquee value just as a solo artist. I know that because I put my name on, on over the, uh, the door of many clubs and I see who, how many people show up. Like, okay, <laughs> me, I'm not the main concert draw. But that said, YouTube is a tremendous blessing and a tremendous curse all at the same time. Right. Because what happens is, you know, in the old days, back in my days, Sonny, the, the, you had to get on a record label to, they were sort of the gatekeepers to have your product distributed that was it. to the that world. That was it, yeah. There was no other way to do it unless you were like selling records 45 out of the trunk of your Unless car. you were the Some Grateful Dead and just touring right. every day and taping. Exactly, right, but, they, but even they had to start in that, you know, they, they made records, the Grateful right. Dead making records and they had right. hits on the radio, that kind of thing. So now with YouTube, uh, you know, I go create something uh, on my uh, on my digital audio workstation, and I and I film a video on my iPad, and I edit it in iMovie, and I put it up on on YouTube. I have instant global distribution. That's enormous power that you had that you did, you just did not have access to back in the day. Sure, the distribution was the thing that you needed. You needed to be able to get your things things out there the problem is so does everybody else it's so diluted it's just there's so many options right. how right. can we really focus how do you rise above rise up you know to the, to the top of that pile like what do you do to get more clicks more hits more listens that kind of thing more spins and that's sort of that's become what the music business has become now like, like how do you do that what, what are the ways to do it so some people are licensing things to video games some people are licensing things to television, licensing right. things to movies, you know, like there are all these different sorts of avenues you can go. You can be, you know, an established touring act, as you say, if you're out there playing constantly, gigging, touring, touring, gigging, touring, touring, you know, you build up a following that way. Suddenly you have more YouTube clips. And then uh, there's one, you know, everybody wants that one thing that goes viral, which makes them sort of an overnight star. But, you know, you've probably been working your whole career trying to get that one thing that finally, you know, breaks through the the, the global consciousness to become celebrated or known. And then even then, if you get 20 million plays on on YouTube, how much money are you making from that? You know, a couple of grand. Yeah, that's not yeah. a career. No. No, that's not a mortgage. You know what I mean? No. Like you have to have other things going on. So, you know, it's very easy to say, as I was joking before, like oh, back in my day, Sonny, we used to do this. But back in those days, too, you know, a record company, if you got a deal with Epic Records, you know, back in that day, you were as an artist, you were making six percent. Right. Six percent. Right. Ninety four percent of the record crosses uh, profits went to the company. Right. Six percent went to the to the artist. And of that 6%, you had to pay for your recording costs, your video costs. Sometimes there was like, you know, tour support costs that all came out of your 6%. So you had to sell a few million records to, to start to make any money. You know, those right. deals were horrendous. Yeah. So the idea was that, you know, by, through the distribution, you would get famous and then you would be able to cut deals later down the road or you would get more concert tours or you'd have merchandising opportunities or things like that. So it was, you know, it wasn't so great back then either. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's always been a mountain to climb. It's sure. just, it's a, just a different mountain this time. It's yeah. a different mountain right now. Yeah. I, I just always, when I go on YouTube, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm with you on the back in my day, Sonny, I just feel lost. And, and I yeah. get when people say, but Greg, it's just so much better now. Like we have so many options and we can go out and listen to whatever we want. We don't have to WBCN tell us this is what's, this is what you're listening to. Right, but right. I, I trusted WBCN. I felt like those guys, I just yeah. watched a documentary about that station. It was mm -hmm. one of the, one of the most classic rock stations, what probably the first cla real classic rock station yeah. in, uh, in America. Yeah. And, um, and those guys were, you know, they were, they, they were playing stuff that not, a, not a lot of people heard and it just started growing and growing. And I guess, 
I find when I go out there to learn new stuff, the only way that I can do that is just by asking people, just asking friends, yeah. asking you like, what's cool now? What, what are you listening to now? Or what are some of the things that you're into? Um, and that's how I do it. But I go on, I go on YouTube, I go on the internet and I just feel lost. I just yeah. don't know where to go. Like it's too much. You yeah. Know, you kind of, you need to sort of catch something, you know, as, as a recommendation that's posted on a friend's Facebook page, like, all right, so the friend likes it. Maybe I should give it a listen. See, uh, what's the guy? Uh, Marcus King, is that the kid's name? The singer songwriter. Uh, I just see him pop up on YouTube all the time. And I'm just like, this guy's tremendous. He's yeah. Tremendous. I'll have you know. to check him out. Yeah. And it's like, but I didn't know him, you know, it's like he came by as a, as, as a clip in my feed and I'm like, what's that? Right. You know, let me, right. Let me give it a listen. And I just immediately, like, he just grabbed me immediately. I'm, I'm hoping getting his name right because I'm so old. I'm like, what's the kid's name? <laughs> I'll have to look that up. So as a, a writer of music yourself as well, today, I guess, when you write music, what inspires you? Yeah, Marcus King. That's his name. I just checked. I'm Marcus. Like, I'm like, make sure. Give him a shout out. Marcus, if you're listening, good work, buddy. Nice job. <laughs> uh, what inspires me to write? Well, what inspires me to write usually is a deadline. If I need a song by Tuesday, <laughs> I'll have a song by Tuesday. Because I used to have a recording project band with some friends of mine, from some Berkeley friends that we all lived in New York. And uh, the keyboard player and I, Jim Dower and I, were, were both interested in, in, in honing our, our compositional chops. And our drummer friend, Joey Joe Goretti, who went on to play with Moby and some people like that, he was interested in honing his recording chops. So we would meet at Joey's house every other Tuesday or something. Uh, I would bring in a piece of paper. I would pass it out. We would do a rehearsal. We would do a take. We would take a break. We'd get a sandwich at the deli across the street. We'd come back. Jim hands out his paper. We would do a rehearsal. We'd do a take. And that was our Tuesday afternoon. Uh, doing that, we have, I think we did about 75 tracks each, which means we recorded like 150 songs over, over about four years of stuff mm -hmm. that we had in the can. Uh, and so that was a power for deadlines. Like I need a song by Tuesday. Like I gotta, I have to have something to bring in. Um, so that you was, feel that you was write big... better that way when, when you're, you know, when yeah, you're sort of on that deadline. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, same thing you're talking about with the YouTube, like when you sit down and like the, the world is open to you. infinite possibilities. Right. All right. Well, what's the first note? Right. Right. What, what do you G? Well, right. Uh, be G, be G flat. What do I, what do I do now? You know? So, I, I learned to take little, little snippets of inspiration from wherever I could find them. Like if I would hear a lick, like I've got a huge iTunes library that sometimes I just put it on shuffle and just let it surprise me. And if yeah. I hear a little lick or rhythm or something, you're like, Hey, wait, 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 what was that? Back that up. The, yeah. You know, it gives me an idea. So you're still getting inspired. You're still getting, you know, uh, snippets of like uh, thoughts and ideas, but you're just really focusing more on it rather than, oh, I'll just let it come to me when it comes to me. I guess when you're a songwriter and you're under the gun, you have a deadline, you can't really do it that way. Um, right. You know, so that makes sense. Yeah. For, for, you know, musicians starting out today, you know, you're in a spot where you've been a, a session musician, a writer for, you know, for a while. What advice do you have for musicians starting out? Do anything else. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. That's why you're so humble. I, I, I if, love it. If you can, if you can do anything else, do that. It's a <laughs> tough road. Oh, it's not easy. But if you can't do anything else, then you got to really be ready to buckle down. It's a lot of hard work. You have to make sure you have the skill sets available. You have to get yourself educated. It doesn't have to be in school. You can study privately. If you're an autodidact and you can get it all from reading books, more power to you. If you can get things from, from YouTube. Uh, for myself, I had to learn to read music. That's a very, been a very important skill for me personally, not for sure. everybody. You know, everybody has a different path to it. But you really, you have to have your game together because what happens when you suddenly do get an opportunity doing whatever, even if it's just sitting in at, at the jam session at, the, uh, you know, at the bitter end Monday night, they say, come up, play guitar for a 12 bar blues and G you have to then know what the hell you're doing exactly so that you get the opportunity to do it again. Right. You're going to get one shot at it, you know, and uh, not to say that you, get, you only get one shot. I failed at things many, many, many times. <laughs> and I continue to fail at things but, and, and you certainly learn through failure, but you know, the times that you get invited back are the times that you've been successful. And the reason that you've been successful is because you've prepared for whatever the situation is. I spent most of this week writing charts for a, a blues gig that I have on on Friday. 
And, you know, you think that I've been doing this for 30 years. I should either know every song ever recorded <laughs> or right. I should have charge for everything. And the guy's like, you know, I want to do Delta Lady and um, uh, something else by from Mad Dogs and Englishmen. Oh, Dear Mr. Fantasy from Traffic. I'm like, I've never played those songs. Sure. I don't know them. You know, I've heard them, sure. But, you know, like bass player, you got to commit to a root on the downbeat. You have to know what the chord changes are and, and for sure. Yeah. Just like grease your way through it. You're the foundation. So, so I've been writing charts. I hate writing charts. I do it my whole life, you know, but it's what I need to do to prepare to be successful on the gig so that when we finish the job Friday night, they say, here's your money. That was great. Can we call you again? Yeah. And I say, yes, of course you can call me again. Okay. Yeah. Last question. What would the present day you say to the young you right now? Uh, that's so interesting. Um, It's hard to know. You know, I, I, I have uh, <laughs> my first tendency for that question is like, you know, uh, uh, taking a plot point from from back to the future. Like you can't go back there. You can't tell them anything because you'll you'll it'll alter the course of history. So, <laughs> right, right. so if I gave myself any advice back then, like, you know, I might. Your I picture's going to uh, start disappearing. Exactly. I might <laughs> fade out of existence. So like you have to be really careful about that. So that my first impulse is to say, oh, no, you wouldn't you wouldn't say anything because I do firmly believe that we are the result of all of our experiences. They, they go through to make us who we are for good or for ill. I might, I might try to impart, even though I, I, knowing myself back then, if somebody had come up to me from the future said, hi, I'm you from the future, you should have more self-confidence. Just, just know that you're valuable, know that you're good at what you do and that people like you. But I, and that's what I would tell myself. Right. But I also know what I was like when I was 18, I would have gone, uh -uh. <laughs> you know, I was in no position to hear something like that. And it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have sunk in to me at all. So that's why I enjoyed your book. And that's why I feel like we have a lot in common from just the way we grew up, even though you grew up in Tennessee, and I grew up in Massachusetts, just a lot. But one of the things I have to say is you, you know, you were somebody that, that took that risk that, you know, that that went out there. And when you had those hard moments, you just, you just push through them and you've talked about all that. So there's so much more in your book. And Ivan, I want to thank you so much for joining me here today and talking about your journey as a musician, a writer, an author. For all the listeners out there, you can pick up a copy of I Ivan's book, Am I Famous Yet? Memoir of a Working Class Rock Star at funkboy.net. <laughs> you can also get a copy at albumreview.net by clicking on the bookstore tab. I put the Funk Boy and Amazon links up on my website so you can get Ivan's book along with some other biographies and autobiographies there. You can also, like Ivan said, you can follow Ivan on Instagram at Ivan Funk Boy and on Facebook at Ivan Funk Boy Bodley. Uh, he's got some really cool pics up there. Ivan, thank you again, man. I I've had a really good time. I've enjoyed this conversation please come back. Let's review an album together on a future podcast. Dig it. I would love to do that. Thank you so much for having me. Your questions are very insightful and very personal. And I, and I really appreciate you, you taking the time to do the research and, and really talk to me, you know, one-to-one -one on this level. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks again. Thank you again for listening to the albumreview.net podcast. Once again, thank you to Ivan Bodley for joining me on what was my 20th episode. Still can't believe it. To pick up a copy of Ivan's book, Am I Famous Yet? Memoir of a Working Class Rock Star, go to the bookstore at albumreview.net. I'll have Ivan's link up there for you to check out and purchase. This book is incredibly interesting, you guys, and it gives you a front row seat into the craziness of a traveling musician in their life. If you're interested in any of the albums I've discussed in previous episodes, please go to albumreview.net and pick up a copy of your own. Listen to all of my podcast album reviews at albumreview.net by clicking on the podcast tab. They can also be heard wherever podcasts are available. I just added Odyssey and our uh, iHeartRadio the other day. All right, people. Lastly, I do want to hear from you. Please email me your feedback, album review requests, and any questions that you have to gpotters at albumreview.net. That's G-P-O-T-T-E-R-S at albumreview.net. Thank you very much. Keep on listening, keep on reading, and keep on learning, guys.
trip down by the highway. Take a 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 trip down by.